So I think we can just jump right into the heart of our evening here. And we have three artists that are going to be presenting their art. We've got Francis Davis, Larry Norris, and Aaron Orsini are all going to be presenting. They will each have uh, about 20 minutes to talk about their, who they are, what their art is, and the psychedelic influences on their art. And then at the end, uh, there will be, they'll leave time, <clears throat> time for questions that you can actually ask e uh, each of them directly at the close of their, of their presentation. And then uh, if, after they've all presented, we'll open it again to any questions that you might have for any of them. So Francis, you're first up. Bring it on, Francis. <laughs> Cool. Well, welcome everyone. And I can't believe how many people are here. Thank you so much for all joining. And thank you to all my, my friends and my fam who's here. I'm really excited to, um, to be sharing with you all. Um, before I, I kind of dig into all of this, um, I kind of wanted to preface it by just sort of saying how, how, how grateful I am to have been able to have the psychedelic experience and to have been able to had the op have the opportunity to experiment and take so many different kinds of drugs. Um, these experiences aren't things that are available to everybody. Not everybody has the ability to source this type of stuff. Um, and beyond that, I'm really grateful that I'm in a position in my life and living in a place where I can talk about these things and not feel worry or concern about some kind of legal problem or other kind of issue. I know um, obviously Larry's doing a lot of work to, um, to try and change some of that, but I just wanted to sort of preface the saying that. So I'm gonna talk about two different uh, drug experiences, um, a little bit about myself and how I've developed as a psychedelic artist. And then if we have a little bit of time left, um, we're gonna look at some wedding photography. So I'm Francis, and um, I'm from New York City originally. I grew up in Manhattan. Um, I graduated from high school in Puerto Rico, and Puerto Rico feels more like home to me than, than anywhere else when I think of home. So in, in some ways, I feel like an, an honorary Puerto Rican. But I am currently living in Portland, Oregon, and loving it. Love the community here. Love the people here. Um, I definitely feel like I've... <clears throat> I've found my place. I studied photography at the Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, which is where I met Lauren Brown, who's in here tonight. And uh, I have two businesses that I run. Uh, Mad Fizzy, which is a commercial and still life business. We uh, do a lot of work with cannabis and uh, different kinds of products. And then Haston Davis Studios, which is weddings and events. And I've been running that business with my partner now for uh, almost seven years. So I kind of just brainstormed a little bit about what psychedelics have done for me just in my life in general. And this is what I came up with. I came up with, they made me more grateful for life. They've given me a deeper understanding of others. They've given me the mental strength and positive outlook to overcome difficult challenges in my life. Uh, somehow after being really deep into a DMT space or way out there on LSD, some of the normal problems you face in, in life just don't hold quite as much weight somehow. Um, it's put me in touch with my sense of inner spirituality. They have alleviated my depression on more than one occasion, uh, given me belief in a higher power that is sort of a mystical universe force of life that binds us all together. I typically refer to this as God, but you can say universe, whatever works well for you. Um, they've also, also revealed my own personal connection to the earth, you know, and to the planet, something that has always existed and will always exist, but in our modern lives and how busy things get and how caught up we, we are with the phone and the job, uh, sometimes we forget that we are a part of this earth and we are a part of 
all the natural processes that are happening around us. And they've helped me to accept myself and love myself more deeply. In terms of my art specifically, psychedelics have showed me the most incredible colors and patterns imaginable, or at least what's power, what's there beyond the sober imagination. I mean, the colors and the, the, the visual experiences that you can have on psychedelics are mind blowing. And that has just saturated my art with um, good content for inspiration. And excuse me, I feel like I'm a little hoarse. I don't know why I'm a little hoarse. I think it's all the cold weather. So excuse my voice. Um, psychedelics have allowed me to access hard to reach emotions um, and thoughts that I can then express through my art. Uh, so sort of things that maybe we ordinarily tend to avoid thinking about or delving into. Psychedelics have a way of bringing them up, particularly something like, like MDMA has a way of really bringing those thoughts and emotions uh, to the surface so we can analyze them and break them down. They've forced me to develop my craft in a way that I don't think I, I would have been able to develop it by um, pushing me to capture things with a camera that don't exist in reality. And I'm gonna talk more specifically about that later. And the psychedelic community, you know, psychedelics have introduced me to some of the most incredible people that I've met in my entire life have uh, become a part of my life because we had this uh, mutual love of psychedelics and the psychedelic experience. Hi, Candy. So I fell in, I fell in love with psychedelics because of the visuals. I love things that stimulate my eyes. I'm, I'm always wearing colored glasses and staring through kaleidoscopes, uh, pretty much anything I can do to make my eye space feel more entertained, I'm doing it. I mean, you can even see like this, like I've got a prism on here. It's like, can we make it funkier? Can we make it more visually appear, appealing? And now my first acid trip, I was like blown away. I was like, wow. So I can take something and like, I see things and things look cooler, like, yes, I'm in. And that was when I think I was like 16. So that, that uh, excitement for it uh, hasn't changed at all. It's still ex as exciting as the first time I did it. And, um, you know, how could something like that possibly be wrong? Something that makes you see bright, brilliant colors and things like wiggle a little bit and move, like, cool, uh, let's do more of this. And like I said earlier, so grateful to all the, the activists and people who are, are working to make those changes so that more people can experience the, the magic of the psychedelic experience. So I gasm. So this photograph of me uh, was taken this past summer and uh, it was taken probably maybe not at the exact moment but very close to the exact moment where I was as high as on LSD as I have ever been in my entire life. It was one of those situations where I'm just gonna take a half hit because he said it was kind of strong. Um, and it ended up being like, whoa, like a half hit was actually, you know, you know, you know the deal. Like a half hit's actually a hit or I don't know what happened, but it was amazing and, and brilliant. And I'm so grateful to my friend, Chris, for for capturing me in, in this magnificent, magnificent state. Um, and that night I, I crawled back to my, my tent and I was trying to sleep and we're not trying to sleep, but you know, just lying there staring at, at the stars and being with my thoughts and the word eyegasm just sort of came to me. So I was like, this was an eygasmic day. I was like, I'm gonna use this in my business. This is how I'm gonna describe my work. And I got home and I looked it up. And obviously I didn't coin the phrase eyegasm. Um, it's defined on Urban Dictionary. And it's defined as when one's eyes find something so extraordinary that the eyes experience an orgasm type feeling. Your eyes want to fuck something. And the definition 
or the, the they used in a sentence that they put was, yo, dude, look at them trees. They're so pretty. I had an eye gasm. And I thought that was hilarious because I was actually staring at a tree in this photo. Like I can still see it in my mind. It was this big, huge Douglas fir tree that I was staring up at and uh, having an orgasmic experience with this tree. So we're gonna talk about a little breakthrough moment that I had. This is a, a specific experience um, on LSD that I had in Puerto Rico. And I had dropped by myself and I was um, at my desk and I'd listened to music and, and painted and kind of played around with some different things, read some, you know, not read books, but flipped through the pages of photo books I'd had, all the kind of like fun, funky, creative stuff you do when you trip by yourself. And the sun was starting to rise and I busted into Photoshop and I started playing around with um, some pictures that I had and some other stuff that I had. And this is some of what I created. And I call these my beach bitches and they're collages. And all the, the photos that are in them are mine, but the, the graffiti art, the street art, and you can actually see this came, this is a, a photo from the street. You can see someone like drew a penis on the bottom of it, like graffitied a penis onto the bottom of it, which is so funny. And I had this, this, this moment where I got really like nervous and felt like, oh my God, am I like using someone else's art? Like, is this right? Should I be um, using someone else's like pieces in my collage, even though I got them off the internet? And I had this moment where I, I had a, a perspective shift and I saw myself as a girl at a desk in a, in a room uh, in a coastal town on an island in the middle of the ocean on a planet. And I realized that screw it. Like it doesn't matter that much. Like what I'm doing in this moment is creating something beautiful and making something for myself, something fun for myself, and worrying about whether it's right or wrong to use a little bit of someone else's um, work as part of a collage isn't serving myself and it really isn't serving um, society. Like me putting the brakes on creative exploration isn't, um, isn't gonna help help us to grow as people you know if i could even see myself as being so important that my collages would help society and humanity move forward you know what i mean um you know and later i looked it up and you know copyright and stuff collage art is kind of categorized differently so even from a legal perspective what i was doing wasn't wrong but um you know as long as i'm not hurting anybody you know why should it matter like this is childlike play and to sort of move on from a place of um, self-shaming for, for any reason with the art that we create um, is an important thing. You know, we, we put these limitations on ourselves about um, what we feel like we should create or should not do. And as artists, um, it's our job to make things and it's our job to push boundaries and explore and follow follow the creative impulses we have wherever they take us. Like that's the purpose in, in my mind anyway of being an artist is to explore where where other people haven't explored before. So so do it. It's your responsibility as an artist to do this. It's your job. Oh, and then, yeah, there's this little quote. This isn't a psychedelic quote, but I felt like it um, It really fit. Um, if we're free from the burden of trying to be completely original, we can stop trying to make something out of nothing and we can embrace influence instead of running from it. So, and this is a quote from, a, from the book, Steal Like an Artist. And if you've never read it and you're, you're interested in art, if you're an artist, 
um, I highly, highly recommend it. It's mostly pictures. It is a super cool book. So ketamine. Okay. So on a high, a very, very high dose of ketamine, you're not really creating. You know, in fact, you're, you're not moving around much. You're in very much a sedated, um, you know, depending on how high the dose is, you may even be sort of in a, in a more of a paralyzed um, state. So, so this, this next little bit is more about integration and how I integrated an experience into my art. So this, this happened in, in Puerto Rico. Um, I was with a very, very close, very, very dear friend of mine. We went way up into the mountains of Guabate and we each took a, a very high dose of, of ketamine and we did it in separate rooms. So was, this was very much a, I'm taking a personal moment to, to have this, to have this experience. And the experience that I had on ketamine, and this was my first time doing it at that um, high of a dose, was the experience of what my soul actually was. Um, you know, with ketamine, um, hopefully I get this right, it's a dissociative drug. So you, you can't see, for people who don't know, you can't see, you cannot hear, um, all of your, your sensory input is blocked. So it's sort of, in my mind, the experience of what it's like to ha not have a body. And if you don't have any sensory um, information coming in through your eyes, through your ears, through taste. And in this, in this experience, I, I realized that I was still there, that my spirit is not um, reliant on my having a body, that my life would continue, not, not my life, but my spirit would continue on even after my, my body um, has reached its expiration, I guess you could say. Uh, so this, exp this piece of art is about that experience of being, being human and taking this, taking this journey and coming back with this, with this knowledge that I am more than just my body. So when I, when I know that I'm going to be going into a, a deep or a deep psychedelic experience or an experience that I, um, I'm, I'm putting intention to, like not just partying, you know, because I, I take quite a lot of psych psychedelics when I'm just partying. Um, but, and, and I do feel like that is, is still incredibly valuable. But if it's something that where I'm making the point, like I'm going to trip and then I'm going to create something out of this, um, I do a lot of self-portrait work um, before and after the experience so that I have um, content to work with, you know, content to collage together if I want to do that. Um, it just feels more honest and it feels like a, a better way to commemorate the experience if I'm creating uh, images in and around that same time. So after, after I had that trip, um, I had my friend drop me off in Viejo San Juan in this hostel, um, which is in the old part of the, the capital city in San Juan. And this room is like $30 a night. It's fantastic. Um, it has these big, huge, do huge doors that open up and you can see the city. So I photoshopped in the the mountains behind, you know, since that was part of my experience, and I and I took self portraits of myself um, in there, you know, and I, it's important to to set time aside, whether it's a few days, like I was able to do for this, or even um, even an hour, you know, or a couple of hours, to maybe write down a few notes, um, you know. Sometimes I'll be able to extract even just a few phrases, um, something small that I can then elaborate on, on more is, is typically my approach to, to integrating a psychedelic experience into my art or, you know, just allowing it to influence me. I have to, have to give myself a certain amount of space um, for it to work. So I couldn't talk about psychedelics in my art 
without mentioning moksha. And the Moksha Arts Collective um, is a gallery. Oh my God, are they here now? Or someone from Moksha is. Oh my God, I don't know who just got here, but I saw it said Moksha. So you got here at the right time. So I couldn't, I couldn't talk about psychedelics without mentioning Moksha. And Moksha is a gallery and a music venue in Miami, Florida. Um, they have tons of psychedelic art. Um, and do a lot of lectures and, and progressive things for the community. But I stumbled in there. I, I think it was Art Basel, like 20, 2010 or 2011. And this was an amazing party. I mean, a party like I had never been to before. Fire dancers, hula hoopers, incredible music. Um, I think there were three stages and something going on in the backyard. And I just said, I will have what you all are having. This is like, this is for me. This is where I want to be, you know? And I, oh gosh, yeah, but some of the people that I've met in the psychedelic community have, have just been so wonderful. But beyond the party, um, you know, Moksha does a lot of, they do a lot of educational type things about, you know, psychedelics, about ayahuasca, indigenous, indigenous people. But when I was there, um, whoops, that's the wrong slide. There we go. Uh, this is some of the types of art that was on the walls there. Uh, this one I know is part of the permanent collection at Moksha. Um, this one I grabbed for reference, but I, I think there may have been one of um, the, sh the Shulgins. If you don't know who Albert Hoffman is or Kiwana Park is, uh, look them up. They're really cool. So, um, The art that we create as artists or as artists who are, are members of the psychedelic community, they have the power to educate others. You know, they have they, the power to inspire people to learn more. It's one of the ways that we're able to teach each other um, about these types of things. And this is the whole, the only reason I know who Albert Hoffman is or who Shulgin is, these because of art, because I saw these incredible art pieces and I was like, who is that, you know? And this was a really sort of pivotal moment for me because a lot of the artists who I was looking up to were not photographers. There were visionary artists and, and painters. Um, not a lot of photographers in the, in the psychedelic scene. And that kind of brings me to like my, the problem, um, my sort of struggle was the camera captures reality, does it really, really well. In fact, that's its whole purpose. That's what makes it cool. <laughs> you know, we trust it. We trust the photographs that we see, you know, we have photographic evidence. But I wanted to make something that was more magical re than reality and something that felt more like the artwork of the people who I really admired. Um, and uh, so I've kind of struggled with how can I make psychedelic photographs with a camera? And it took me a while. But I'd ordered these glasses from uh, holes. It's like H, then I should have put on H, then the number zero LES. And I bought them for, for like partying as like fun tripper glasses. And one day I took my cell phone and I, I held it up to the lens and I was like, oh, cool. Like I can take pictures with it. Lo and behold, the lens popped out of these glasses fits perfectly on my 50 millimeter lens for my uh, D750. So I asked Ray, the founder and organizer, if I could come and make some portraits during some of the events. So this is some of the work that, that I created. So this is a, a portrait of Alex Gray. And uh, I was nervous as all get out asking him if he would sit for uh, a portrait by me. 
and of course he was super nice and empathetic and smoked a bowl with us and and more more than friendly the way so many people who are you know in the psychedelic community are um i created this one of this one of his wife allison gray and then this is the the digital art i created later this one of randall roberts whose work i absolutely adore he does a lot of portrait um work too in his paintings oops um dennis mckenna terence mckenna's um brother but doing this project gave me the validation that i needed to see myself as a psychedelic photographer um, to see myself as an artist that was contributing to the conversation um, and i also stopped feeling the need to hide where my inspiration was coming from i was fully able to say like i am out i take psychedelic drugs they make me a better person, they help my life, and um, they're helping me to develop my art. So everyone who's in here, um, obviously is, you know, you guys are all involved with the psychedelic community. And I feel like that's so important and such an important thing to, I don't know, to encourage other people to do, you know, other friends, people that maybe don't have an outlet or don't have anybody to talk to about these experiences, uh, you know, we don't as artists have to be creating in like dark solitude like in some like little room like pouring our hearts out you know like we can be collaborative you know and we can work with each other and and bounce out ideas back and forth that's the whole point right so after this moment you know this this just it was on after I realized I could stick a prism in front of my camera and make something happen, I was like, what the heck else can I put in front of my camera? What else can I do to the scene? What can I do to alter the set that I'm photographing? Um, you know, because with psychedelics, we're, we're changing our internal lens. We're changing the, the lens that's within us. But with the camera, you got to put something in front of it or you got to change something else in the scene. So it was such a light bulb shift for me that I could I could do these things and not have to rely on Photoshop because I felt using Photoshop this was pushing me into the like I'm a digital artist but in my heart and where my love is is photography and is and is the camera so I've explored a ton of different techniques um, for for capturing things uh, directly in camera so reflections is a big one you know, I feel in a way that reflections are like portals. Um, you know, we go through our lives and you get these little glimpses where something will be a little bit distorted. And it looks like, ooh, that's trippy, you know? And it's, you know, reflections in water or something through a pane of glass or something. And these were, um, these are just, there's no Photoshop happening in any of these. They're just straight photography. sparkles and iridescent light, which I feel when I'm on acid, things shimmer and, and mushrooms too. Things shimmer and the quality of light when you're tripping is so beautiful. It's like being in a hologram or something where there's different colors and they're, they almost seem like they're happening at the same time. Um, and that's something that I'm super exploring in my work right now. Um, you know, my Instagram feed for like the past month is basically just flowers with multicolored light, um, trying to kind of recreate some of that iridescent um, light that I get to experience. And then sparkles. So using sparkle filters to create um, these sort of sparkly effects, because I don't know if you've ever had any, but like, I love sparkly acid. I love it when it's like bring, 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 bring. Trails and tracers. When I'm on mushrooms, I got them a lot. Where you see like a trail, like just this trail. So this is done with shutter dragging, which is just a longer exposure. Um, and I also do these in front of a, um, I've done it in front of a projector, which is kind of like a very 
um, retro aesthetic in terms of psychedelic art to, um, to use a projector. So that's where the inspiration came from to even introduce that, um, that as a thing. Uh, stroboscopic flash, which is where the flash like pops out more than one time and you're able to get these, um, these sort of layered like double vision type of um, images. Francis, I'm going to interrupt for just a second here yeah. because um, we're running a little bit long and I want to oh, make yeah. sure that each person has their full amount okay. of time. And so generally we have um, time at the end of each person's presentation for questions. And so I think what I'd like to do is have you just wrap this up and any questions that the audience has for you will leave for the end so we can move on to the next artist and have enough time for them. Okay, so, okay, that works. I actually, I have only two slides left. Okay. So I, could just, I could just do those two slides and then be done or, um, or if you would just want to come back to me. Go ahead, I'm Francis. I'm really fast. I'm like, I, I thought I was so close. Sorry, I'm going over you guys, sorry. Okay, so. Party vibes, bright colors. Um, with my product work, it's all about fun. And it's all about making it seem like you could be at a rave almost. So that's that. So my mission is to access something otherworldly through my art. Um, and where science ends is where art begins. So it's our responsibilities it's our responsibility as artists to go where science cannot. And it's also our responsibility to inspire science and to inspire politics and to inspire society. So that's the power that we have as artists and that's the power that I, I gained through my use of psychedelics. So thank you guys. <laughs> Sorry if I went over. Ah, thank you, Francis. It was fabulous. Okay. I'd like to be able to spend more time with each of those images. <laughs> I know, maybe it's too much. And I have stuff about weddings. If anyone later is interested in just hearing about wedding photography being psychedelic, maybe we can like figure that out. Yes. I, I, I want to hear about wedding. To hear about that. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, really beautiful presentation, this. Francis. Thank you. Presentation. <laughs> So we're going to move on to our next artist. And I just want to let anyone know who has questions for Francis to hold them until the end. So our next artist is going to be Larry. So Larry, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Nice to see everybody tonight. I'm going to try and do that share screen thing. So give me a second here. Do, do, do. Okay. Here. There we go. And there. All right. I don't have the uh, <laughs> the fancy, well done graphic uh, slideshow that Francis just showed us, but you'll just have to make do. I apologize ahead of time. Uh, my name is Larry Norris. Everybody, uh, very nice to to uh, be here with everyone today. Uh, I am a co-founder of uh, Erie, which is Entheogenic Research Integration Education. It's a uh, nonprofit here in the Bay Area. We've been working with peer integration circles. I do some art integration, also do educational events uh, since about 2011. Uh, I'm also co-founder of Decriminalized Nature. Uh, we have quite a few things happening across the U.S. right now in terms of changing policy. Actually, some big news just came out with California. Uh, also something going on with Vermont. So things are happening all over the place. It's really exciting right now, giving people the opportunity to make sure that they have access to be able to grow, gather, gift, uh, share in ceremony, community-based practice, that type of thing for antigenic plants and fungi or psychedelic mushrooms and, and plants. Um, I also just finished my PhD about a year ago, um, and that was looking at um, sort of ayahuasca experiences and integration. So these really profound, interesting, weird experiences that people were having, and then how do people make meaning of them? So really looking at integration as a meaning making process. I found for myself as well, I really got into that in terms of my own art. Like, how do I make meaning of my experiences? Because sometimes they're just so far out there or they just really stick with you and that you just can't quite figure out how to undo them or whatever. And so 
um, being able to um, have an opportunity through a creative process to work with that was really great. And I actually had, <laughs> I had to actually uh, paint one of the transcripts I was working with because it was just such a interesting thought process. So the, the whole experience was so strange to me and interesting to me that I just wanted to kind of put it on canvas. So you'll see that later in the, in the piece here. Um, the way that, uh, hold on. Of my chat box in the middle there. Uh, the way that we're going to kind of go through today is so show you a chronology, so it'll kind of start to finish in terms of my art process, but also sort of the different ways and styles. So sometimes I try and mirror the experience. Sometimes I play with emerging visions and things like that. Uh, sometimes I'm working with active imagination, which I'll talk about in a bit. And then sometimes I'm just trying to sort of unpack these weird abstract concepts. And this gives you time. You know, you spend you know, so many hours working on a piece, you can really start opening up into sort of like, what is this really about? What is this really, what's really happening there? You get deeper into it, you know? <laughs> and everything here was inspired by my actual experiences or learning a process that helped me sort of uh, integrate some other experience in life. So I'll talk about that when that comes up. But the first round I want to show you is my black and white pieces. And so the agreed with Francis that the colors are something that's profound in these experiences and they're really amazing. Um, but I had this experience that I really had to sort of break through that was kind of this black and white experience. It was really strange. Um, also, I know Francis was talking about validation. I was working at a gallery and so I was like, to the manager, hey, can I put some of my pieces up there? And everyone's like, you're, you're, it's not even art. I don't know what you're talking about. Just let me just put them up on the wall, no, no problem. And it was really interesting and fun to be able to share and talk with people about the pieces. And for whatever reason, it's different in Maui than it was in San Francisco. San Francisco, people want to talk to the artists. When I was in Maui, people wanted to talk to me if I knew the artist. And then they were all about, oh yeah, oh, this is interesting, what's going on here, da, da, da. But if they knew I was the artist, they didn't want to have anything to do with it. So that was pretty interesting. Um, and then here, I was actually on the Haleakala Times for an art show they did out there. Um, but what's really great about these pieces is, you know, this is representing this, this experience I had where I went into sort of the, the ether, and this is, these are all ayahuasca experiences. I went into the ether of the space where it was this like, the snow, like this sort of um, static, you know, like you would see on, uh, you know, you know, TV or something like that. But like this is a static, and it was felt like it's not this, not that. It was almost I wouldn't say non-duality, but it was a space of like things were happening, and I felt like I could, if I wanted to go and never come back, I could have just jumped into that sort of sea, right? And the sea was full of images and full of designs and all this kind of stuff. And then as I realized, um, I kind of had these like bungee cords attached to me. Right. And one of the bungee cords was memories. One of the bungee cords was fears. And one of the bungee cords was desires. And through this process, I realized how easy it was to release the memories to get me up there. But the fears and desires were like, there's a, an infinite weight of mystery on them. Like I couldn't, I couldn't go there until I had addressed these other issues because the bungee cords were so strong on me. So I came back and was like, okay, well, I have to really sort of address some of these fears and desires that I have over the course of life. But in that process, I really want to sort of practice and play with this sort of this this image of this sort of field of uh, um, a static <clears throat> here's you no know, before I go back there uh, here's kind of a close-up so what happens like inside of all this is, this is like a close-up of these pieces you can see it gets really intricate and what's really great about this is like for these pieces here for example I would sort of start falling asleep you know, I'd do these really late at night and then I start falling asleep and the black and white creates like a contrast in your eyes Right, so there's like a jumping back and forth that happens. There's almost like an undulation. There's like a static movement, if you will, you know. And then, and I also I, I learned after that I needed glasses, but uh, but I have astigmatism, so everything kind of like moves like this. So it creates a dimensionality that other people weren't seeing. I was like, so you don't see that? But during this process, I would fall asleep, and then I would see something, and I'd be like, oh. And I was actually talking to somebody the other day. There's like a whole scene in here that's like a dream. Yeah, I woke up. And then I was like, oh, and I saw this thing in the piece and I just kind of sketched out the dream. So they're also kind of played with that. And what was really great about this is that certain lines, certain, certain just working with that knife, and this is all on scratch board. So this is like a black and white with a white clay backing, just working with that knife, certain, certain angles, certain, the feel of that sort of carving, the certain, certain curve and just the right way, something will come up something will pop up from my experience. It was so, it was kind of playing with these lines, playing with these directions and things like that, that would actually help me uh, work with my experience. So that's what all these kind of experience, uh, first kind of realm for me was these black and white scratch board working on some stuff. 
then as Francis so uh, eloquently stated, and as most people know here, the colors are just like, well, this isn't representing the colors. You know, okay, I have this thing going on. There's a it's trippy, it's stuff's going on and it's helping me sort of work with my experience, but where are the colors at? So, but working with a knife for so long, it's really hard to jump from a knife to a paintbrush because the paintbrush doesn't do what a knife does, especially if your hand isn't used to working with the paint. Oop, is you still seeing that or no? Can you see my screen still or no? No. No, okay, so I don't know what happened there. You might be seeing your screen, but it's black. Yeah, I don't know why I did that. So let me stop sharing and real quick here. Can you see that now? No. Vamos a bailar. Algo que está perro, que toda la gente no Hold on a second. <laughs> I don't even know where that's coming from, to be honest. I must have some other thing going on here. Um, so let's see here. Do, do, do. Yeah, dance break. <laughs> it's incredibly fun. <laughs> do, do, do. All right. Is this better? Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. I don't know where that music came from or anything. It's very interesting. I don't even have any windows open. So thank you, computer or whatever that happened there. Mm -hmm. um, so this, uh, this piece here, this is where I said, okay, well, I want to start working with some painting. Um, let me, but it was, I need to do like realistic paintings. So here's some pieces when I was in the Amazon, this is up Haleakala and, and, you know, the crater, this is Maui, this is sort of uh, uh, ayahuasca vine I painted, but it wasn't doing it for me. I wanted to get something that was, you know, was, wasn't touching into the experience, it was reality, but it let me play with colors some, you know. Um, then I started playing with this, which is this Mish technique, and I learned this Mish technique actually from uh, Roberta Venosa and um, Mariana Hoffman, I believe was her name, uh, who are two visionary artists. And they were kind of teaching us about um, this sort of three layer process where you can kind of, so I would just like draw out the piece and then you sort of highlight it. And then you paint with like a, a, a purple, an orange and a green. And those three layers create an optical gray. So you see here, that's all three of those layers. So it's not a straight gray. It's like this like translucent sort of vibrant gray. Uh, and then you kind of put your colors on afterwards. So this was a really great way to sort of let me get start exploring the weird, more weirdness of the experience while adding color to it. Uh, here, the one of this, this experience here was uh, uh, Ganesh. I don't know if many of you probably have had experiences like this before where, um, by the way, my time totally switched when I turned my thing off. So give me a heads up when it's 15 minutes or getting closer or whatever, by the way, Maggie and folks, if you don't mind. Um, but, uh, but the Ganesh character right here came up in my, uh, my journey. And, uh, you know, I was like, you know, it was sitting on my throat and it was kind of blocking all these things out. And I was like, what was this elephant creature? Right. And they're like, oh, that probably is Ganesh. And then I looked it up and it's, you know, part of the throat chakra and it's a remover of obstacles or, or placer of obstacles. So, again, really interesting. You kind of tap into these archetypal sort of images and visions in your journey. And then you come out and you do some research. You're like, wow, these are pretty great. You know, these are actually, this is actually what it is. <laughs> it was doing the same thing, you know. Um, so this was kind of my, my mish area. Uh, this is really fun to play with. And then started getting into this active imagination. Like I say, I'm a self-taught artist. So this was all, I carve out what I see versus trying to paint something because I wasn't very good at it. So, um, but it was a good way to sort of just see what was coming through. So I'm going to play this here and it shows you kind of the process of this piece. You know, it's all just a mess right now. There's nothing happening. I'm just still kind of looking for what's there. I see seeing some images and they start sort of popping out you know, from the experience, from the journey. Uh, I was doing this at the same time that I was actually uh, at, at CIS as well. And so what they were teaching us around this time was that uh, to work with this sort of active imagination, kind of this Jungian framework. So Jung kind of worked with this in the Red Book, right? It's where he would have engaged conversations with the characters that showed up in the pieces. And so through this process, I was also dialoguing uh, having sort of a conversation with different color pens with each of the different characters that came out. And this actually works really, really well when you're trying to sort of get back into sense with, you know, like if you have, you know, big ayahuasca experience or mushroom experience or whatever, you're sort of having engaged dialogue with these other beings, what have you, but you don't really remember, you maybe need to check in on an insight. It's a really kind of easy, playful, fun way to reflect on that uh, experience again go back into what those insights were, kind of see what was happening, uh, really sort of reflect, see what the personalities were, see what their sort of interaction with you is, and kind of look at it, this relational thing, you know, because if we are talking about spiritual spaces, if we are talking about sacred spaces, then 
there is this dialogue to be had. There is a conversation to be had between all these characters. And so here is one way through active imagination and through painting that the painting kind of opens up, you know, the sort of the, the nonverbal kind of conversation. And then you're open up more to say sort of This is almost done here, but uh, but as you can see, it just kind of you just kind of keep carving away, carving away, carving away until the final piece comes. And you know, I didn't I didn't know this was what was going to come up. It just kind of emerged. And I think that's a really fun way to kind of play with it, especially if you're like me, self taught artist. You don't have to think like, oh, I didn't do this right. You're just constantly working its way up. You know. <clears throat> this next one area here. This is the painting right there that I just showed you. And these are also other active imagination pieces. This one was done in 2012. I had this cosmic weaver come up quite a bit. You know, a spider is the cosmic weaver. I called this cosmic portal number five. And this is me just like cruising along, oblivious to what's going on. And these other travelers are like, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know, when you're in some of these ayahuasca spaces, like you're like, whoa, what's going on? Uh, and so this is this kind of this representation, sort of having some dialogue with them. It's like a wizard figure here. We have like sort of a feminine figure, it's some snakes and some underwater stuff going on there and then kind of get into more of the integration the actual integration work so this is when i sort of played with all these other approaches and now i, I feel a little bit more confident with the brush i feel a little bit more confident with being able to vision things that come out i feel a little bit more confident with working with these spaces um, and so I, I started tapping in a little bit more into you know you know not just the visual concepts but also kind of these sort of strange and unusual abstract concepts. So here actually, this one here is a painting that would came from the dissertation work I was looking at. So uh, this one was like the, the woman said something like, I realized there was no great big bang. It was just uh, an alien blowing bubbles and the planets were forming. And I was like, that's such a beautiful imagery. I, I really want to kind of see what that looks like. So I kind of played with that a little bit. He's blowing through a DMT molecule though. So not quite a bubble blower, you know, so. Uh, and then some other ones here. Um, same thing, but these two here were really interesting because one is like trying to, to recreate in, you know, like integration as art versus integration as writing is so different. You know, I look at this painting right now and I know exactly, you know, if I like tried to read the words, I'd miss so much of this. And this painting here was, uh, you know, I, I was having ayahuasca, I had the cord of my <laughs> sleeping bag all around my neck and I had to like untangle it and it was this whole mess. And then I had this cords in front of me and I would sort of fuck them. And this maybe, <laughs> maybe Aaron will talk about music a little bit better, but about this vibrational thing. Um, but so each of these sort of layers, vibrations, a reality would come. And I would kind of go in and explore that. And if vibration wasn't right or off, it would kind of get all messy. So, um, so this piece here was really interesting because it was really like, you know, for me, again, going back to that spider, going back to the cosmic weaver, going back to the idea that everything is connected through this web of universe. You know, and so uh, so this was that piece there it was just really trying to integrate that and that one there is more of like a, I wanted to show what the experience was. Some of these are more exploratory. This one is showing more. This one here is conceptual. Uh, I don't know it's for, for those that of you that have done ayahuasca like you know there's this 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 idea I think like Francis was saying too like what do you, what do, you do? How do you move through space when you have no body. How do you move through space when you don't know who you are? How do you know move through space when consciousness and awareness are just a thing, you know? And so uh, this piece here was really kind of looking at that. And, and uh, you know, for me, it was nausea. You know, when you're in these ayahuasca spaces, everything's gone, but you feel that nausea. So there's still, but it's not nausea, it's this energetic, it's this turbulence, right? And this turbulence can help you move forward. And so for, I don't know why, but for every reason, for me, nausea turns out to be two balloons with a bicycle thing. So you know that's how that's how that came out. But the idea was there was that it's something that's propelling you without any other things. It's an energetic that you can kind of work with. So like in terms of working with a purge, you know, sometimes you, you vomit or whatever, or have some other experiences with ayahuasca, to really kind of ride that up and to, to utilize that energetic to go farther into the space rather than just purge right away. You know, some people like to purge right away and that's good. You can kind of get your healing out that way. But also there's this, this element right before where it brings you that energetic that can move you forward. And so uh, that was something I was trying to represent there again. So now I'm looking at integration. You have, you know, painting what you saw, replicating kind of the ideas of, of what you're thinking about and then also just tackling abstract ideas about what is nausea, what is movement through space when you have no body, what is consciousness and awareness, what are these different things? Because a lot of these questions, yes, we talk about depression, anxiety, and all this thing, 
But a lot of this is about the nature of reality, about the nature of consciousness, what's happening here, what's going on. And so really to dive into this, it's really art is a good way to do that. And then uh, second to last slide. So I don't know if my time frame is closer now, but just let me know. Uh, here we have sort of some archetypal ayahuasca. Um, you know, there's a lot of snake kind of energy in the ayahuasca. I have a lot of cat energy as well, but these are kind of representing those. Uh, this was kind of similar to that previous experience. So whereas you, when your body just like disappears into the universe, but then everything around you is thick, super thick with visions, right? And so this experience here, actually, this is, uh, I've been kind of working on this and continue. Both of these are still kind of under construction, um, but this was something I was trying to represent of like this, the, the inside is kind of blown out and then everything on the outside is just fully intense with a bunch of visions. And this one here was really trying to tackle the idea of the fabric of reality. You know, what does it mean? What's the, what is the fabric of reality? What is that even, you know, is the, how much space and dimensionality is just right in front of our face? How many aliens or entities, why do we have to go out in space? They're all like right here, they're all here, you know? So, so this piece here was really like, what is it like if this 3D world is flattened to two dimensions and you can just open it up and kind of peek through, you know? And I had some experiences like that and it was really fascinating to kind of think about the fabric of reality. Think about how we can play with reality. You know, sometimes we play with words, sometimes we play with actions, all these different types of things, but it's all sort of malleable, it's all workable, you know? And there's something just on the other side that's here to help us, that's here to engage with us, give us wisdom, what have you. So again, we have that spider in there, um, but really kind of looking at that, what does that mean? So. That, that was actually something that's still on my wall. I'm still working on it, um, but I thought I wanted to show it because it was really fascinating in terms of um, really kind of just trying to figure out what that even means, the fabric of reality. Um, so I don't know where I am on time. I'm probably over, but that's me, um, Larry. Uh, if you liked any of my pieces or want any pieces, they, they, are sell, they are for sale. So if you want to support a artist, scholar, activist, please give me a call. Uh, uh, email there for that. I also, like I said, work with Erie and also Decrim Nature. So keep an eye on what's going on around uh, the world. We're doing a lot of great things and uh, help support those if you can as well. So thank you. Thank you, Larry. That was great. I don't know. Hold on. And, I if, and you were and you were on thank the dot timing wise. <laughs> uh, but it, there was no time left for questions. So let's just move right on to Aaron and have him get his full 20 minutes and then we'll open it up to questions to all three artists Perfect. so thank you larry yep. and aaron you get to go next all right awesome well thank you so much to, to peggy and to holly as well and to francis and larry as well for being a part of this and uh you guys are amazing uh art uh so far it's wonderful to see um i'm really uh just grateful to be here Grateful for you all as well for being here. Um, and uh, even my, my parents who are here in a rather unconventional space for them. And they are, uh, I'm always grateful for their support uh, throughout all this whole journey that I've been on. So uh, I'm just gonna jump right into it. I prepared a slideshow um, that uh, essentially I wanted to display two uh, works for you all tonight. Um, and they are, um, the first is going to be a uh, film piece uh, that I created in collaboration with an MFA film student out of uh, the UK who is producing it for like their final project for their master's thesis. Um, and that film is related to like nature connectedness and other themes related to kind of altered state experiences. Um, and then I'm also going to be showing some, um, some footage and some music from a piece that I composed along the similar timeline that I took uh, when I created the uh, Autism on Acid book. Um, and that's a piece called Astral Reflection. Um, it's about 53 minutes long in full and it's all like original music. And I went to school for um, what's known as motion graphics and compositing effects, uh, which is essentially like building 3D art across time and like manipulating cameras in a 3D space. So it's a really unique kind of skill set to be able to convey some of these ineffable experiences. Um, and likewise, through that lens of music as well. Um, I do a lot of time nowadays talking a lot and I'm excited about this presentation because I'm pretty much just going to show you guys stuff and you can listen to stuff. Um, because part of this art and the significance of it for me, especially the astral reflection piece is just it, it to me it speaks for itself in, in the sense of it just being what it is and <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it to that when we get there but um, 
it's really important to me that piece uh, I spent hundreds of hours probably between the music and the editing of it all um and yeah like if I get like hit by a bus tomorrow or something like play that at my funeral because it's my, my most proudest piece mostly because it has no me in it it's like a it's like an ode to like the universe of energy like the beauty of all these things. Um, so the first thing that we'll get to before the astral reflection thing is just the autism on acid, uh, a little short. Um, it's about like three and a half minutes long and it's one portion and to kind of put some context behind it, um, the it's essentially capturing a part of the second chapter of my book, which I since put into like an audio book. And for the audio book, I also soundtracked the whole audio book with music that I also had produced during those years of using LSD to really get in touch with myself, with other people. Um, now I'm on like a incredibly important uh, sort of journey of my own. Um, and now one year, uh, almost to the day ago, I had put actually the Autism on Acid book out for free uh, because of the Plant Medicine Day that we're coming up on tomorrow, the Thank You Plant Medicine Day. Decided just to drop it down uh, to zero to give open up for donations and people have responded well. And there's now been about 10,000 people now that have read this book. And uh, so with this film coming out, um, I think that'll be even more impactful and hopefully as we explore some of this work tonight it does a lot better of a job than reading like a 2D kind of uh, representation of something so I'll get into that and then I'll show you a little bit of how like the music itself was produced because a lot of the music that you'll hear throughout the rest of this presentation was produced under the influence of LSD um, and that was also intentional and it was had to, a lot to do with what I was navigating as far as like emotional intuition and landscaping so sort of like certain feeling states and almost using music as a means to push myself into extreme emotional states. Uh, if it, like a very simple analogy being like just kind of using like low bass to like really bring down the same way you'd soundtrack a film with that sort of like soundscape. I was like soundtracking like my sensory system. Um, and so to be able to capture those pieces and bring them back with me, it's almost like I could then reactivate those same states within myself. And my curiosity is to also share this music with others and see if it brings about those same like states, whether that's like an ecstatic state or a soothing state. So that's most of the talking from here. I'm just going to play some things. So I thank you again for, for being here and I'll play this next piece for you. Um, and as far as my involvement, I was uh, just there just to narrate and produce the audio for it. Uh, the rest of the cinematography and animation was from a student named Caleb from Portsmouth in the UK. So I'll play that for you now. So I carried on, barely living, but at least living. And on one of the darkest hours of the darkest days, I decided that rather than ending my life, I would instead put an end to the life I built. And I did what a lot of anxious and confused people do when they're pushed to the limit. I ran away. I went into a tree. I didn't tell very many people, other than the few connections I barely managed to maintain in spite of my isolated state. But I retreated. I sold all my stuff. I packed a bag. I bought a train ticket. And I headed west to see if there was something, anything, that might be worth living for. And a few days into my travels, I was presented with the option to try LSD. And being at a point in my life where I felt very much out of options, I took it and I sat in the forest, waiting to experience one more failed attempt at escaping the waking hell of existence, when suddenly, whew, holy shit, it was connection, such connection. I felt it in so many ways. I felt it. And with so many parts of my processing centers woven together for the very first time, so many realizations seemed to come crashing in all at once. In the initial hours of the experience, as the LSD began to take effect, I felt more and more connected with the trees and the breeze and the sunlight that surrounded me. I experienced a deep moment of engagement. Yeah, a moment of connection with nature, the thoughts of my parents, my family, my friends, and this whole human family and this broader web of life. And I know it sounds so cliche, but I was just awash in this sense of deep, deep love for so many aspects of my life. 
In this single session of LSD, it not only washed away this background hum of suicidal ideation, amazingly, befuddlingly, wow, what the fuck? I not only didn't feel like killing myself, I felt very much like living, because I felt very much alive and connected. And feeling connected meant I cared about who and what I was and what I was connected to. And I felt this sense of connection so deeply. And it wasn't a hallucination. It was a realization. An intuitive sense that my well-being was directly connected to the health and the well-being of the natural environment within which I resided. Expounding on this further, I would say that during those initial hours of that first LSD experience, I felt a sense of care for myself, for others, for the world. I cared about it, all of it, and I felt like the world of human beings cared about me. And I... Whoops. <laughs> Hold on a moment. That's not the right time. One moment. All right, let's uh, try that. Yeah. Sorry, I left the sound off. That's kind of the point of the presentation, but I'm back now. <laughs> uh, but I'll just pick it up from where it was. Well, just imagine there was some really moving music and some voiceover in there. And, uh, we were here. Oh, it was? Yeah, we heard Yeah, we heard it all. Yeah, okay. we heard it and saw it. <laughs> great. All right. Well, then back to it then. Um, great. Sorry. No, I thought I saw something. But it's all good. So, well. So I care. Well, to summarize, that, uh, that's what happened there. Anyways, that's like a summary of the most important thing that ever happened to me. But like, <laughs> so that all happened. And uh, then this book came through. Um, and in the time since. Uh, I've been spending my time just going around and gathering stories from other people uh, who have gone through similar experiences and learning more about it. Um, and similarly, the same uh, music that you're hearing in the background with really yet more music that I was producing during that time. I had left like a kind of an office job at that point and I had the spaciousness and time to kind of really be with myself. But I spent a number of weeks in like, uh, exploring like the nature of being and during that time was when I produced a lot of this music and captured a lot of this energy. Um, and I since I put all that music out, uh, I thought about all these things. And it's just sitting out there, there's like hours and hours of all these tracks. Um, and as I said before, you know, I created these as a sort of like safety blanket for myself for some of the more challenging things I was processing. I think there were definitely moments of like, kind of like a nirvana kind of experience or transcendence, but there were also like, processing of a lot of trauma like difficulties in my life and uh this particular track was the one that was playing and i timed out this three and a half hour and this particular track is at the point of which the lp is we're hearing your voice and the music yeah, and we can't actually hear your voice over the music. Okay. Let me yeah. Back. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Let's see if we can get back to that. So, I think it's fine. Things are happening. Um, but no, so this music was all produced during that window. And to give you like a little window into how that music was produced, I would kind of like pack a bag in advance and I would record like small little beat kits going in before those. And then I would set those on pretty lengthy movie. And then I'd be able to build on top of those doing more improvisation moments of performance when I was kind of navigating some kind of thing. So it's just like a simple MIDI drum kit that's set up as such. So that's like one element coming together. And then I would go and really like put myself in settings that were really conducive to really capturing like a certain energy. Um, Aaron, uh, we're still hearing music and your voice, and it's hard to hear them both. Okay. Actually, I, have, I have a suggestion. It sounds like if you don't have the if you don't share share the screen, if you just play it 
we were hearing it at a reasonable volume with your um, play the right yeah. yeah so if you don't screen like your thoughts like your like thoughts we're gonna go with that all right let's start that over again Mer mercury in retrograde we're gonna blame all technological issues on mercury in, in retrograde even when it's not in retrograde Back anymore again. i'm just Oh man. So I placed myself into these uh, scenarios where I felt like I could kind of capture the essence of the environment um, and have that sort of spaciousness. Um, and this was really healing to me. Uh, and I think it's a wonderful kind of model, I think, for a uh, tool for someone to have access to a musical instrument. Obviously, it has roots back in like shamanic cultures and drumming and these things. Um, but to have access to these other kinds of tools was uh, really interesting to me and brought about like a certain again, like a way to really bottle that that feeling and bring it back with me and still I like call upon these uh, kinds of moments to kind of come back to over time. So let me just take another sample. So that's all sitting out there on the internet. If you want to listen to more crisp versions of that audio, <laughs> but it's not. Um, but that's all sitting there. Um, and I'll really briefly try to. To me, the most important as I said at the head, uh, this is a combination of compositions that I created, uh, foundational rhythm tracks. Um, I also did what's known as compositing, which is essentially like a, a video equivalent of like scrapbooking, similar to kind of what Francis mentioned earlier, um, but working with like filtration and layering and camera movements, things like For this, And just let you just watch this little
reflection and then we can hear you more easily because we're hearing both yep can you hear me better now now perfect yes thank you that was terrific that was amazing it's the second time i've seen it but i saw new things in it this time yeah, so we have each artist has had their their time and we still have time for questions so anyone that has questions that they want to address to any of our three artists this would be the time well i'll ask Erin, what um what program did you use to cut together the um those videos? Like, how were you creating those um those different layers in, yeah. in the last one that we saw? Yeah, so it's a combination of softwares. Um, I've primarily worked like a lot of the elements were originally composed in a software called After Effects. It's like another Adobe Suite software. Um, some of them also were just like royalty free stock, like simply like not so interesting images layered in interesting ways and other kind of capacities. But and then those were all like rendered and like put out through a software called like Cinema 4D. Um, and like some Final Cut and I don't know, I like lived inside of a computer for like 15 years of my life. Uh, and <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of stuff. I, I think everybody blown. must just be blown away I by know, all like, I, art because we usually are just inundated with questions <laughs> and everybody is just dumbstruck. <laughs> yes. Did you have a comment or a question, Holly? I, well, I do have tons of comments, yeah, and, and questions too, but I, 
I don't know. Like, I don't even know which one to start with too. This is also why I'm, that's why I'm just like, what, like my brain is just like, boop. Um, I, I don't know. I love, I just want to say thank you to all three of y'all beautiful work. Thank you for sharing yourselves and your work too. Like, uh, and very inspired. Like I am inspired by all three of you. And um, yeah, I, I don't know. I am just kind of, I'm, I'm a little dumb, dumbstruck as well. I normally, and that's, that says a lot. Normally I have a lot to say. <laughs> I have a question for Larry. Sure. Hello. So the last paintings and things you were showing, you were describing like you were carving away. I, I didn't understand the, me, the medium you were using. Were you painting it or were you had paint on and you were taking paint away? I wasn't sure. Yeah, it was like um, the carving process was basically, yeah, you know, the, the first series with the blacks and whites, that was actually, well, I mean, it wasn't carving, but it was using a knife and a clay. So there was that carving feel, that texture, right? Uh, which was actually really great to play with because it just feels differently than a paintbrush would. Uh, but the second half, what I was speaking to was like making a mess and then carving away with paint. Yeah, so that you're you're sort of bringing out what's there. You know, you, you know, it might be all kind of lopsided, and you kind of carve out some of that so that something else comes up from it. Yeah, that's me as an uneducated uh, artist calls it. <laughs> There's probably a term for that. I don't know, but um, but uh, but that's kind of what I was doing. So you kind of just kind of carve out, you know, that different area. Um, so that it kind of, you know, hones or polishes the image that I was looking for. So what's the surface you're, you're using? Uh, everything on all of those was canvas, mm -hmm. uh, except for the black and whites, which were scratch board and uh, done all with acrylic paints, except for one oil. I think the Haleakala piece was an oil piece, but oils, I was playing with oils a little bit and then having a studio, quote unquote, where I was painting and next to my bed and headaches and stuff that just got to be a little bit tricky so i decided to work with acrylics which are a little bit uh easier on the nose and uh uh you know the sleep time you know the dreams are strange but <laughs> that's the good of the headaches the the one that you did the video where you just started out with just 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 movement really and and stuff mm -hmm. and then eventually became an image that was just an amazing process could you say a little more about that the layering yep. of that yeah, sure. No, I mean, I think that's that's how I start. That's how I do almost all of my pieces. I can show you the, you know, the pieces. A lot of them are kind of starting off that way, where it's just like, I just do a lot of strokes. I create a mess, you know, and then I like stare at it and maybe I take my eyeglasses off and I let my eyes get kind of watery and I see what's there and I pull some, carve some stuff out as the term that we were using and pull some stuff out and see what, hap see what happens. But, you know, I, I took a picture. I, I haven't done that often, which I maybe I should do more often because I do like how it looks kind of all together there and kind of see the, how it moves from piece to piece and what kind of becomes emphasized and then de-emphasize those types of things. But I was doing that for also for a class to do this active integration. So I was actually writing down and taking pictures to put that all together and actually like sort of line up some of the, the conversation that was happening with the figures or the entities, or the beings, the archetypes or whatever you want to call them uh, in the piece. And so uh, that whole piece came together. It also has some text with it, but, uh, but it was really great. You know, I mean, it was just a, it was a good practice in um, relating to your art versus seeing it as an object that you're engaging and in, in making. It's like, you no, know, there's a relational issue here. We're both working together. The painting is working me. I'm working it. The characters are working me. I'm working them, those type of things. And it really opened up my understanding of art a little better uh, playing with that active integration or active imagination, I should say. Cool. Thanks for sharing that. Yep. Thanks. Um, Alex had a Alex has a question in the chat box, and that um, Alex would like for Francis to tell us more about how you incorporate psychedelic inspired art into your commercial wedding photography, which I find fascinating as well. I want to hear more about that too. <laughs> Oh, you're muted. You're, though, you're muted, Francis. You're still muted. You're still muted. There you go. Right now? Okay. Got it. There's, oh my gosh, there's so much that I could, I could say about um, how I incorporate um, 
psychedelic inspiration into my um, wedding photography. I could show tons of imagery related to it. Um, but to kind of like maybe quickly answer it, um, I would say it looking for, as I sort of talked about in, in my presentation, looking for um, portals or looking for things that express psychedelic vision that occur within um, our regular our regular life, seeing things such as um, reflections or um, objects that will create distortion when placed in front of the lens are things that I seek out. Um, I'm also looking for compositions and frames that are unexpected um, or associations that are unexpected, um, things that show connection um, or things that show relationships in unusual ways. Um, and I'd say that my identity or being able to identify as a psychedelic artist, which was a concept I hadn't even thought of until when I chatted with, with Peggy and Holly and, and Larry and Aaron when we were doing our, our pre-conversation before this Zoom, uh, is that I feel like I give myself a ton of permission to step outside of the norm when I'm creating wedding photographs. Um, I don't feel the need to place my couples inside of a box, you know, inside of a traditional um, bride and groom or even bride and bride, groom and groom type of box situation. It's more, I'm looking at people as individuals and their story as an individual person on that day. And I'm sourcing more in excuse me, more inspiration um, from that. I mean, I could show what, I mean, I could show wedding photographs if you guys, you know, want to see them or if there's more time later, I have um, plenty of photo example photographs that, um, that I can show. You know, and I use prisms and I use gelled light and I say, screw it. If, you know, that's not what your grandma likes. I mean, we're going to do a few photos for grandma on wedding day. Like, don't worry about it. But for the most part, we're exploring something a little bit more creative and a little bit more um, abstract. Um, yeah, so, so that's that. I, I don't know if we have time to, to, to dip into, into something else. I'm, I'm happy to, but I don't wanna, I feel like I already used a lot, <laughs> a lot of time earlier, so. Well, we are, um, our official end time is, past. <laughs> what I would like to do at this point is ask that people who want to see more of each individual's art use the links that are there in the meetup to each person's art, or you can communicate with the artist individually. I do want to thank all three of you, and I want to thank our audience, and I want to remind our audience that if you have art that you want to share, or if you know of an artist who you think would be um, interested in participating in our salon, be sure to contact us and let us know because we, we are just open arms to hearing from other artists. So I don't have anything else that I um, need to say here at the end. Anybody else last minute comments before we close our salon for the evening? I don't know, thank you so much for including me and and thank you to everybody who who presented it's it's been such a pleasure yes great time thank you very much everybody appreciate it and shout out to francis as well for taking the taking the reins on the upcoming uh portland uh art salons as well so yes yes i agree and i want to and i want to say Thank you, thank you, thank you, Holly, for all that you've contributed to creating, helping me create this salon and making it a reality where we can host our, our artists in our community. And it's been wonderful collaborating with you, Holly. And I'm looking forward to continuing this kind of collaboration with Frances, who will be our new hostess. Yes. Good night, everybody.